One of the debates that haunts my comment section, both on my Patreon and on the YouTube channel, is a debate that doesn't seem immediately relevant to the left at all. But it is a debate that is why I often think when we complain about the left, we and we should often criticize what people call the left, although, as I've said many times, that is more of a vibe these days, and probably has been more of a vibe since the middle of the 20th century than it is something uh, clearly articulatable. But beyond that, we have to think about the left as being subject to the same systemic problems that larger societies are subject to. And the reason why the debate over free will and determinism, which comes up in my comment section all the time, eludes me is because I think it's a debate that misses the point. We have options. Our mental technologies are part of the options. I call them technologies. You can call them whatever. Uh, developments, systemic ways of understanding, culture. They give us means and agency But they don't and never will overcome all of the systemic limitations. And systemic limitations are something we need to think about because they affect not just the world that we live in in the obvious ways like implicit bias and racism, our wealth gaps between sub-demographics of racial groups, our class existence in general. They affect us in ways that are not obvious, too. One of the things I've tried to do about, like, people who want to complain about, you know, do meta-Marxism, applying Marxist analysis to Marxist intellectuals, is I'm always like, but you don't do it to yourself. You know, I've made the offhand comment that people who complain about the PMC almost always are the PMC, and when they claim to be speaking up for other people, they don't actually know the concerns of the people they're speaking up for. Occasionally, you know, you will meet people who work with the public in a way that puts them in intersection with working class people in a, in a large variety of ways. If they work in government buildings or in hospitals or in schools or, frankly, uh, if you want negative examples, EMTs, law enforcement, etc., now, you might go, why did you list EMTs and law enforcement together? Uh, in this scenario, the biases of those groups are going to be based on the biases of what they see. And those are going to be negative outcomes. All right. Nonetheless, that has an effect on the way you think. I talk about Joseph Tainter's. Rise and collapse of complex civilizations a lot. Joseph Tainter is not a particularly good Marxist, not a Marxist at all. His understanding of Marxist comes very much out of the dominant interpretation of Marx that were popular in the mid to late 1970s, even though his work is really popularized in the 80s and he's still, you know, doing work today. His own outsourcing of his ideas around Marxism, for example, actually prove a point that he's talking about. One of the things he talks about is the narrowing of knowledge, not because of a lack of knowledge, but because increasing specialization is needed to deal with complex systems to the point that changes in the systems actually break down the, system, the systemization of bureaucratic apparatuses that hold them together. This will lead to an attempt to simplify the system, usually in the form of a strong man in a Bonapartist reaction or imperial reaction, which can force a political crisis because if the strongman is successful, ultimately, and I say strongman here because it is almost always a man, um, the system will be without requisite expertise and a population that is self-sufficient enough to do things on their own which leads to accelerated collapse and recomplexity as soon as the individual figure is gone. Now, on the left, there's a tendency 
to see the entropy that usually led to revolutionary situations coming to the forefront, which is based off of things usually larger than any systemic singular event. Like whether the, the Bolsheviks would have won is not just based on their strategy, although without their strategy, that wouldn't have happened. It is also based on a series of objective and subjective conditions beyond any of their control. World War II, I mean, World War I had to go a certain way. World War II had to go a certain way. And in both cases, it led to certain developments happening, which is why focusing on the figure of Stalin for what happened in the USSR is often misleading. But that's often used as a defense of the USSR. The problem is, if you actually follow that logic through, Systemically, what you get to is there's a point in which a decision was made, which made it irrevocable that certain things were going to happen that were going to exhaust society and lead to a system that was not sustainable. So where do you where do you start looking at with that? Well, one is that you had a nomenclatura, a middle class of specialists and apparatchiks who even when they came from the ranks of the working class themselves were separated from them by the nature of their jobs as delegates and as this happened and as this was established the only way to control them particularly in the period of the 1930s was violence but that exhausts society and leads to retribution and things that no one can control it unleashes social forces that no individual no matter how charismatic or powerful they are can completely rein in and in doing so exhausted a lot of the expertise base within the the USSR, but also, and in a very key way, broke the society. The purges, as many Stalin defenders, were in some ways truly organic, quasi, you know, para democratic revenge, but often took a character of a revenge cycle that had nothing to do with even class. These things happen when you unleash those social forces. And part of it was aimed at controlling apparatchiks, many of whom were not even necessarily all that threat to the government are unfair, but there's a lot of resentment at them when things failed because they were the people empowered to oversee the situation. And when things failed, um, they're the people you held responsible. When that went away, it led to massive apparatchik corruption because what else did you have to control them? Very little. Now, that's a vast oversimplification to the complications of the Soviet Union. But it's something people need to think about when they talk about what happened and why it happened. Why did the instantiation of early Soviet capitalism go the way it went? Well, one is the Chicago boys and stuff like that encouraging bad decision making. But two, in the privatization of capital, who had capital? It was the youth common terms, which were allowed to run co-ops during the perestroika period. And it was people who had capital from uh, criminal expertise and people who had control of app of apparatus and the nomenclatura, criminals, etc., were able to come to power. All right. There's very little way to control them because they already have the apparatus there. And thus, you know, the only way to really control them is usually like a member of their own running said apparatus, usually with an iron fist because it's run by a minority by a minority. These are systemic things that Marxists used to talk about more clearly. Marxists talk about that violent governments are usually run by min by minority positions because they have to be violent to maintain their position. But this also affects the way we think. All right? One of the things that happens is highly specialized societies are actually given towards very seemingly irrational moral panics because the specialists outsource their thinking to other people whom they trust. They're not generalists. They expect there to be other specialists whom are thinking this for them. And so this leads to faddish thinking because it's easy to posit yourself as a moral specialist, particularly when things are so complex that achieving actual competence in the system is limited. 
not just because it's hard to do, but because things change so fast that competence is actually really, really variable. So you might be competent today and not tomorrow. So you have to devote an inordinate amount of your resources to maintaining that competency or you have to fake it. Now, this leads to, frankly, moral panics and very emotive thinking. And it also leads to it amongst the working class, too, because they feel because, you know, for example, right now, one of the things that's ironic is in some ways the United States, for example, has been never more politically divided. And yet almost everybody hates the rich, doesn't like the government, um, doesn't trust corporations and resents uh, educational elites in the upper middle class. That's almost universal. So much so that even educational elites in the upper upper middle class take on those affectations. And yet, we focus on the things which polarize us more. For example, things in which there's broad public agreement. To give you an example, uh, most of the United States population, even the conservatives, thinks that we should be encouraging restraint in the Israel-Palestine war for Israel. And that what Israel is doing is, at best, an overstatement and, at worst, genocide. Now, that is an opinion that is shared by something like 80% of Democrats and over 50% of Republicans. All right. And yet, you're going to have a harder time getting corporations to care or signal about that, one, because it affects their international trade, and two, because they want to look neutral to governments. Whereas, looking positive to populations within governments, such as the Black Lives Matter protest, even though that was, in some ways, more divisive um, in popular opinion, they got plenty of reason to do that, because they're not going to lose their base market for the most part. The, the people opposing them are downwardly mobile, usually petite bourgeois, or they're ultra-rich and they're not catering them anyway. And they open themselves up to a new market, which may be on the up and up in current, just in terms of population size. That's a systemic change. It explains why, quote, woke capitalism happens, right? It isn't from the kindness of people's heart or an ideology infecting people. Nor is it necessary the victory of progressive thought or a progressive capitalism, whatever that is. It's systemic changes. Furthermore, however, as differences between certain parts of, of you know, social classes equalize, you're going to see the assumption that the poorest elements of, of society are going to be people of color and that thus they are predictably going to vote in line with, frankly, a gentrified over $200,000 earning uh, Democratic Party elite is uh, a faulty assumption for the same reasons that it was a good assumption 10, 15, 20 years ago. In some ways, success systemically undoes the the advantage, which Democrats probably know, which is probably why they have so little incentive to achieve anything. But there's also a little incentive for people to question that if they're high, if they're highly specialized. Most highly specialized people are in the are 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 Democrats. There's an educational bias towards that for a variety of reasons, given the fields that require education in the United States. That's a new development. When conservatives started complaining back in the William F. Buckley years about the liberal biases of university, it actually wasn't true. It is true now. There are a variety of reasons for that. Self-selection, the kinds of industries people go into, the values inherent in those fields, the ways that those fields have relationships to government contracting, etc. But it leads to different kinds of thinking, and people are always outsourcing their thinking when they can. That is the problem with the heuristic of trust I talked about earlier. In some ways, you have to use it because you cannot know everything, but it is always a limit. And that limit leads to you trusting people that you probably shouldn't. It's because 
actually it takes a lot of expertise to know who to trust. And that is systemic too. So yes, there's systemic racism, which happens because of a variety of things, because implicit bias, because of social systems which re-encode those bias, because of wealth gaps and the accumulation of wealth over time. There's also systemic things we hide by looking at things purely in clear self proclaimed demographic categories, as opposed to class or other things, having vague definitions of what all these things are. I mean, how static has the poverty line been in the United States compared to inflation? Remarkably so. This means that thinking systemically means also looking at the way that these things affect your own thought. What are likely to be your own biases? What are likely to bring them up? If you want to get beyond your limits and really start to build something that can last and deal with the systemic problems of society at large, you have to realize where you are. But this is a kind of self-criticism. The self-criticism is often abused. It's a way to get people to trust other authorities and themselves. Um, but we have to look at systemic incentives here. One of the ironies is that a lot of people enter the NGO space with the sincere want to help people, but in their sincere want to help people, there's competing NGOs who compete for the same resources. This leads to petty backbiting because the skin in the game is actually competition for helping the game. It's not people helping themselves. Also, this is one of the limits to mutual aid. If mutual aid remains outside charity of workers to poor workers, and it never is truly mutual, then it doesn't build up any systemic power base of people to empower themselves. But the, that argument is often used to just throw people into an electoral circuit of which they cannot win either. Because they haven't built up the institutions to do anything other than to primitively accumulate cadres to get people into elected offices where people with far more money and resources will immediately have access to them and start shifting their politics. And if you don't believe me, look at what's happened to the squad. It was nearly inevitable, something that I've been talking about since 2017. So, we have to think about the systems. And we also have to think about what it means to have skin in the game. Being in the NGO means you're involved, but you're not involved directly. This is why it matters about, you know, I always talk about the difference between union staffers and union reps and union membership. Union staffers are great. We need them, I suppose. Um but they're professionals who aren't actually in the business that they are repping. So when the DSA has a lot of control over, say, union bureaucracy, and it's coming from people who are trained in business schools and then go on and become activists and work for NGOs and then salt for unions, if they even salt, they don't have the same skin in the game. And this is a problem. I mean, we saw the attempt to go back into the workplace and salt and do it that way in the 1970s with both Marxist Leninists and Trotskyists doing it to no avail. Why do people think today will be different just because we gave it up for 30, 40 years? Working class organization is, I believe, one of the only ways we can get beyond these points. But that does not mean just repeating the strategies of the past. Particularly when you don't know what the strategies of the past are and why they were incentivized. What were the incentives that the various systems that we were operating under in a capitalist totality leading to? Then and only then can you start to break down what you need to do. Why do we talk about the prematureness of revolutionary action or the prematureness of a party? Well, because if you start a party too early, all you're going to be doing is spending all your effort to build the party and not do anything else. And that usually leads to sectarian formations because you don't have enough power to deliver on anything. You can't really pay people back or build your promises. 
No, you just have to promise in the future as you build more cadres that you'll eventually be able to do it. Now, I hate to tell you that that's not how anything has ever happened. That yes, politically speaking, the Workers' Party movement actually came at a low point of the Workers' Movement, but the Workers' Movement have been building for nearly 50 years before it happened in Germany or in Russia. All right. It should not also systemically surprise us that after failing to have any effect on local reforms, particularly when a closely, you know, aligned group is in power, that people turn to foreign policy as where they see their politics at. Foreign policy, which they often, you know, stand opposed to in only symbolic ways. Might be good for building solidarity, I suppose, but it's not good for even changing that policy. But it makes natural sense, given the systemic incentives of continuing to fail at doing anything for domestic policy. At least when you fail in foreign policy, it's not your fault. You don't have control over that anyway. But you now see where the incentives are. It's to actually put you in places where you cannot actually act on anything beyond symbolic moral sentiment sentimentalizing. And you may think your brave stance on Twitter or your flying a flag on your profiles is really taking it to the man. It, I promise you it's not. After all, the man's providing you with the means to do it, you fucking idiot. Like and subscribe. If you want to get beyond the Klug, you need to think for yourself. You need to build power for people like you. You need to incentivize them. Now, I could say if you share this, you're doing stuff for that. But you know what? Dependency on another media maker? No, that's not going to build you. It's not going to build that for you. You have to build that for you. So like and subscribe if you want to. Don't if you don't. Doesn't really matter much to me. I'm not maximizing my SEOs anytime soon. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.